Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this uh, very first session of our six month biocontrol technical workshop series uh, of under the ASEAN Fall Army Worm Action Plan. My name is Alison and I'll be the moderator today's, for today's session. I'm joined by two experts from CABI, Roger and uh, Mark, and, and Mark will be doing much of the presentation today. Uh, we also have our technical uh, expert uh, for, for our webinar platform, Pranav, helping us out. So if you have any problems, you can um, message him in the chat box. Uh, and we have Graham Dixie, Executive Director of Grow Asia, joining us as well. Just to uh, reiterate, I, I showed a few people this before, but we do have a really big session. We're going to break it up into three parts uh, and we'll have question and answers uh, in between. It will be a bit flexible, so we'll see how we go uh, and see how the session runs uh, and where there's good, good times to stop. But please um, really take your opportunity here to ask our expert, Mark Kennis, uh, all the questions that you have on this topic. And we'll try and cover, uh, we'll try and cover all of them. And if we don't cover some of them, we'll write those down and come back to you. So here is how you will interact with the platform today. Uh, you'll write all your Q&As in the Q&A box, please. It's, it's really helpful for us to have questions all in one place. The chat is there for sharing documents, your research, um, thanking a speaker, sharing a link, highlighting an important point. We really welcome you using that as well. Um, if you can rename yourself or just make sure that your name is correct and you can do that by going up to the top more box there, uh, which is under number two two and you'll just press that and you'll have a little place to rename yourself. So that's that's most of the sort of highlights for how you interact. Uh, I just want to reiterate this is the first part of the six month series. We're really excited to launch this. It's supported by Grow Asia, CABI, IPM Innovation Lab, BioRationale, International uh, Rice Research Institute, ERI, uh, ICRISAT, and um, the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. And we'll, bring on, we'll be bringing on more experts as well as, as, we, as we go along. Uh, anyone is welcome to join this. It's not just for those in Southeast Asia, but uh, if you're further a field, uh, please tell, uh, well, please, please stay with us, but also welcome, we welcome others attending um, as well. And we really want an interactive six month sort of uh, workshop series, and we would really urge you to join the discussions, uh, post your work, share your comments, ask questions at the CABI research portal. And I've provided the link there. And after the session, I'll also email everyone that attended today's session with that link as well. And just to give you an idea of uh, the wealth of topics that we'll be covering over the next six months, I mean, this is quite outstanding. I'm sure if uh, after today's uh, session, you'll be hooked and you'll want to come and watch all, all of them and participate, but you'll find something for everyone there. So please um, spread the word because we want uh, lots of people participating, lots of people interacting, and we really want to hear your successes in the field and your failures over the next six months so that we can learn from that together. As I said, there's the agenda. We saw that before. Um, I'm just going to launch a poll quickly. Pranav, if you could launch the poll. We've had over 300, 313 people register for this event, which is incredible. We just want to get to know you a little bit more. And I've put in lots of different uh, categories there. So I'm sure you'll find something for your, that best describes who you work for. And we'll give people just a little bit of time to answer that. We've got 117 people on so far, so that's that's pretty exciting because I know it's pretty busy coming up to, to Christmas for some people, also the end of the year for other people, and uh, we've had a lot of uh, webinars this year, so it's pleasing to see everyone joining us for this event, 121 people. I'm going to stop it when I get to 90. Oh, there we go. Polling is closed. So we've got about 39% government, and I guess I can just... Can you see, can everyone see that? Yep, you can view the poll results. Uh, 32, a third research institution students and 14% private sector and international organizations. Okay, that's good. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna get started with all of you uh, and we're gonna move to the next slide. And I'm going to welcome Graham Dixie, Executive Director of Grow Asia, just to say a few words to welcome you to the session. Graham. 
Yeah, thanks, Alison. And uh, first of all, you know, it's my really pleasant role to, to welcome you all on board. Um, it's it's it, it is astonishing to me just to see how the community of practice that Alison and the Regional Action Pac Programme has whipped up with uh, over 300 people um, registering and well over 100 already attending. It's an extraordinary um, achievement and, and particularly in contrast to see what we're seeing on other kind of webinars. Um, and uh, well, I thank Alison for setting out a, a six month program, eight different events, ending up in a workshop in June. There, there's a lot of meat here and it's an important area, this biocontrol. Um, this, this is really digging in about how we can control this particular pest without having to recourse to agrochemicals. And this is such an interesting area insofar as you know, what we're hearing is that the market for biocontrol products is growing by a compound annual growth rate of 25%. So it's an important area. It's obviously an area of interest and it's an, in, gonna be an important tool in, in controlling this pest, which we estimate could, if not controlled properly, caused the farmers in our, our region over $800 million of lost income per year. So back to you, Alison, and over to Roger. Excellent, thank you, Graham. Thanks for the introduction. And we couldn't do all that organization and have all those experts without um, all our um, coordinating partners who we really value. And um, one of that, one of those partners from the very start has been CABI and it's, uh, um, I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Roger Day to, to provide a few thoughts. Thanks, Alison, and thanks, Graham, and uh, hello to everybody again. It's uh, great to be co-hosting this new series of webinars, and we thank uh, Alison and Croatia for all the work they've done to put it together. Um, biocontrol is a subject very near to the heart of CABI, so, so that's why we're very pleased to be uh, leading off this first uh, webinar in the series. We always talk a lot about IPM, integrated pest management. Biocontrol is the basis for IPM, really. So this is a critical area in managing fall armyworm. And today's topic, I think, is the basis for all biocontrol investigations, whether it's products, augmentation, classical biocontrol. You need to start all that with knowing what natural enemies you have. And that's what Dr. Mark Kennis is ideally a place to talk to us about. He's been doing this for many years and he's been working on surveys of natural enemies of fall armyworm in Latin America and in Africa. So he's undoubtedly got some very good tips for us all. Thank you, Alison. Yes, indeed. And it's, it's a pleasure to have um, you on board, Roger, and, and the CABI team. And a pleasure today to um, introduce uh, Dr. Mark Kennis. And I, I think you've given him already the introduction, so you've you've done the job for me, Roger. But um, Mark, it's a, it's a pleasure to have someone with so much experience, um, over 30 years of experience in, imply, in applied and environmental entomology. Um, Mark is also currently leading the risk analysis and invasion ecology section at CABI in Switzerland. He really is an expert in this field. And it it really is a pleasure to have him join us. So Mark, I'm going to give you the floor um, from now so you can start when you're ready. If you could put, you can choose to put your video on or um, choose to have it off, it's up to you. Oh, well, yeah, I think it's better to, to keep it off. Oh, you want to see me first, maybe? Yeah, that would be nice, hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hello. For the moment, uh, we still see the, the presentation, but... Uh... Yes, nice to see you. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those who don't come from Asia. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I've been asked to talk about field collection and identification of fall armyworm parasitoids and predators in the, uh, just a question, just a technical question. Can we have, uh, can we, can I switch off on my screen all the messages that come and uh, hide my slide. The chat, can I switch off the, sh the chat or not? Yeah, you should be able to close them, Mark. There should be uh, the arrow putting down. You click that and you hit close. Okay, because there is a, there are messages that come all the time on my screen and they disturb me from the slide. So it's, it's a bit complicated to, like, I don't know how to do. 
Sure. On the top left of the message box, there should be a little arrow pointing down. If you click that, another thing will pop up that says close. Okay. Okay, I I don't I don't really see it, but uh, it's okay. I will I will manage with I will try not to read them. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this is um, so this is a talk about field collection identification of four armyworm parasitoids and predator. Don't expect me to give a very exact protocol because I think that this kind of field particularly needs a little bit of, uh, of flexibilities and need to be adapted to all the different uh, situations. So I really don't advise you to, uh, to necessarily follow very, very strictly any protocol which you may find be used elsewhere, but give you the flexibility to adapt it. Next slide, please. Yes, so the, the, the plan of the presentation is as follow. Uh, I will start as a kind of introduction to talk about parasitism and predation of fall armyworm and why is it important to know the local natural enemy complex before developing biocontrol projects. I think this is a very important question because I see uh, too many people who like to study the natural enemies but at the end, they don't know really what to do with these data, except by saying that, yes, there is already or there is not yet a biocontrol going on, but nothing else after. And I think it's very important to understand why we do that. And the second, and this will be the most important part of the presentation, is uh, how to assess the natural enemy complex and their impact on fall armyworm, fall armyworm population. Impact means uh, parasitism uh, uh, rates and predation rates and so on. And I will finish uh, with a short section on uh, on identification of uh, natural enemies. Next slide. Of course, if we study natural enemies, it is because it is directly related to biological control. And um, and uh, I I feel I, I still need to give a, a definition of what I mean here by biological control very quickly. Uh, so biological control is the manipulation of living organisms, which are natural enemies, to control other living organisms, which are pests. So this definition uh, is important because it means that it is only when you are using uh, living natural enemies that you are doing biocontrol. There are lots of other uh, methods, like for example, pheromone trapping and so, which are often included into biological control, but in the strict sense of term, it's not biocontrol at all, even if it can be a very well, uh, seen as well and, and, and very positively seen in, in, in IPM programs. So we, we really talk here about natural enemies. Next slide, please. And uh, what are the natural enemies of uh, fall armyworm, uh, especially in the area of origin? Well, in the area of origin, uh, the, first, the first category, which is the, the best known uh, natural enemies, are the parasitoids. They are the best known because they are the, the easiest to, to study. Um, so, the, so parasitoids are wasps or flies, which which parasitize uh, one single um, host during their life. They can, and and in the Americas, there are over a hundred species which are, have been recorded as a, as natural and as parasitoids of uh, fall armyworm, both in in North, Central, and uh, and South America. Some are purely egg parasitoids, which means they parasitize the eggs only. Some are egg larval parasitoids, which means that they parasitize eggs and come out and kill the, the larvae, usually medium instars. And uh, next slide, please. And, uh, but the majority are larval parasitoids and they can attack small larvae, early larval stage or or old larval stage. Uh, most of the parasitoids which attack the old larval stage of fall armyworm are, are tachinidae, while usually uh, uh, the wasps attack earlier instars. And some of these larval parasitoids also emerge from the pupae rather than from the larva. Next slide. And of, of course, we should not forget the pupal parasitoids. Uh, 
um, they are much less known, especially because it's much more complicated to sample pupae in the soil or in the litter than the larvae and the eggs on the foliage, but uh, they should also be better considered. Next slide. The, and then the other category of uh, fall armyrum natural enemies are predators, uh, which feed on more than one um, prey in their life, otherwise they would be parasitoids. Um, so the predators, most predators are, are insects or at least arthropods. They, they, they can be, uh, they can be earwigs, ants, bugs, beetles, spiders, etc., etc. But we should not forget as well the, uh, the vertebrate predators, for example, the, the birds, the insectivorous mammals, frogs are also sometimes important uh, uh, predators of Folami worms, etc., etc. They are less well known for reasons I will I will uh, I will mention later. Next slide. And then I I just want to quickly mention that uh, the third category of natural enemies are, are the pathogens. They, they may play a very important role in the population dynamics of the of the pest, virus, bacteria, fungi, microsporidia, and so on, and and also uh, entomopathogenic nematodes, which are not directly pathogens, but they carry a pathogens that, that kill the, the host. So these ones will not be the topic of the talk here because there will be other sessions later on the, on the pathogens which are used for, for biopesticides. And so I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, the pathogens. But, but parasitoids and predators uh, um, need to be studied uh, in the in the area of introduction in Asia, in Africa, and so on, uh, for uh, different reasons. Uh, if you, I guess you, you probably know that there are three different categories of biological control methods. And for all these categories, it's important to know the natural enemy complex in the region of introduction. The first category, just to remind you, the first category is the biological control by introduction or classical biological control, which is the introduction, for example, for fall armyworm would be the introduction of a, of a parasitoid or a predator from Latin America to, to introduce into Asia or Africa. That is for permanent uh, establishment and control. This is, this is classical biocontrol. The second category of uh, biocontrol is biological control by augmentation, which is the augmentation of the density of natural enemies by regular releases. The release can be inoculative, which means that you inoculate at the beginning of the season or the year, a small number of biocontrol agent that will reproduce, but you need to do that every year after year or season after season. Or inundative, which means mass releases for a single and immediate control, which in, in this case is quite similar to the use of, of pesticide. In, in the case of fall armyworm uh, parasitoids or predators, uh, um, this is, for example, the case when you release trichogramma or telenomus to control uh, to parasitize the eggs in an infested um, uh, field. The third category is uh, biological control by conservation. This is usually well, uh, much less known, but this is all the methods which favor the efficiency of uh, natural enemies which are already present in the system, but for the moment are not very efficient. This is, for example, in this case, uh, if you want to do intercropping or if you want to, uh, if you, if you want to reduce pesticide and so on, you will augment, you will enhance the natural enemy complex. And for all these three categories, there are good reasons for studying the natural enemy complex in the area of introduction. Even for when you are uh, strictly only doing biological control by introduction, which means uh, just introducing uh, from the Americas a natural enemy for permanent uh, establishment and control, you still need to, to study the natural enemy complex in the area of introduction for various reasons. Next slide. The next slide, yeah. Uh, so, and the first reason is that the candidate natural enemy 
may already be in the region of introduction. And a good example with uh, fall armyworm was Telenomus remus in Africa. When fall armyworm arrived in Africa, there were, all, there were quite a few uh, people or organizations who were thinking of introducing Telenomus remus, which is uh, an egg parasitoid occurring also in, um, in the Americas to Africa. But, but thanks to surveys, um, uh, thanks to surveys in Africa, uh, we found out, and many of us uh, found out in different countries, that Telenomus remus was already present in Africa. God knows how it arrived there, but it was already present. So there was no need to introduce this. But we would not have known, of course, without a, a proper survey of egg parasitism in the different countries. Next slide. And the second reason is that it is usually when you do classical biocontrol by introduction, it is always better to fill an empty ecological niche than introducing a species that will compete with a local natural enemy. And, and a good example with that is with uh, braconids of the genus Kelonus, this egg larval parasitoids. So in, in the Americas, uh, Kelonus insularis is probably the most abundant, the most frequently cited parasitoid of fall armyworm. But also when uh, research started in Africa and then later in Asia, we also found out that, that other Kelonus species were also among the most important parasitoids of the fall armyworm in the introduction region. And this needs to be taken into account when you want to select a parasitoid. It may be better to select a native parasitoid in America for introduction to Asia and Africa, which does not compete directly with very similar uh, species. Uh, third, uh, next slide. And then finally, um, post-release studies require baseline knowledge of parasitism and predation in the area of introduction. What does it mean? It means that if you uh, want to introduce a parasitoid into, an, into a new region. So once you have done that, you need to, um, you need to know the impact of this parasitoid, including on the natural enemy complex in the region of introduction. And if you don't have these baseline studies to know what happened before the introduction, you cannot do that. Next slide. So the second category of biological control method is biocontrol by augmentation. So the regular releases of, um, of natural enemies in the, in the case of, uh, of, um, of fall armyworm, it can be, uh, it can be egg parasitoids or predators, bugs, for example, and so on. Well, then in this case, the reason for studying uh, the natural enemy complex in the area of introduction are as follow. First of, co of, of course, you need to identify potential candidates for mass production and, uh, and regular releases. So it's, that's quite, that makes sense. And also uh, that it, it's much easier to obtain permits for producing and releasing biocontrol agents which are already present than than by introducing uh, natural enemies for augmentative releases, which are not yet in the region. And it's also environmentally safer. There is no environmental risk or much lower environmental risk to use for this kind of releases, natural enemies which are already present than those which need to be imported and go into all the, all the procedures. No, please, can you go up? Can you go back? Sorry. Yes. Uh, and, and a good example is, uh, is the story of, uh, of trichogramma. Trichogramma is uh, one of the two uh, egg parasitoid genera, which is used against fall armyworm, uh, the other one being Telenomus. And uh, in, in the Americas, um, they are using trichogramma pretiosum, which is a, an American species with some success, medium success. Uh, trichogramma pretiosum is, does not often occur naturally. But when it was, when the fall armyworm was introduced in, in the different countries in, in Africa and Asia, there, there has been a lot of pressure to introduce also trichogramma pretiosum because trichogramma are very easy to produce, to mass produce. And, and they wanted a trichogramma which is known to, to work more or less against fall armyworm. On the other hand, when surveys were made in Africa and Asia, there were other trichogramma found, like for example, trichogramma kilonis 
was found in several African countries. It's also found to be abundant on fall armyworm in Asia. So, and, and actually the rate of parasitism of Trachogram achillonis is much more important in the invaded region than the rate of parasitism of Trachogram pretiosum in the area of origin. So why would you introduce Trachogram pretiosum if you already have Trachogram achillonis, which, which occurs naturally on fall armyworm? But of course, you would not have known that if you had not done the surveys of egg parasitoids in, in Asia and Africa. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, and then of course, exactly for the same reason as uh, as um, as classical biological control, uh, even for augmentative biocontrol, we need uh, baseline studies on parasitism and predation before releases to see whether there is any kind of impact on the on the natural enemies, uh, especially on egg parasitism. If you want to release egg parasitoids mass release egg parasito, you, you already need to know what, what is the natural uh, rate of, uh, of egg parasitism in the region, of course, to, to assess also the success and the potential impact on the, on the biocontrol agents. Next slide, please. Okay, um, then uh, biological control by conservation, the third category, um, which are all the methods favoring the efficiency of natural enemies already present in the system. Of course, there the reasons for studying the natural enemy complex become immediate. You cannot uh, favor uh, the efficiency of natural enemies already present in the system if you don't know these natural enemies already present in the system. And only a very good knowledge, not only a list of uh, natural enemies, but also a list of, uh, of a list of the factors which enhance or suppress them will allow the development of conservation by control strategies. For example, uh, you can you can uh, enhance them by uh, using intercropping rather than monoculture or flower uh, uh, bands and so on or for example also um, uh, chemical pesticides uh, you can also moderate chemical pesticides for example by changing uh, to a biopesticide or by lowering the uh, the amount of spray or by uh, changing the timing to, uh, to enhance the natural enemies. But for this, you need to know exactly which natural enemies occur when and uh, to which level. There are also other ways of enhancing natural enemies. For example, in Africa, in some countries, they are using fish soup and sugar to attract, uh, to attract ants and things like this. But, but all these methods need a very good knowledge of the natural enemy complex in the area of origin. Uh, sorry, in the area of introduction. And with this, I think I finished the first uh, part. Alison, do you want to take the, the questions now? Hi, Mark. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, what I think we'll do is we might, we're just waiting for some questions to come in. Um, I think that's a very good introduction and that's exactly what we need to start. I think um, there'll be lots of questions coming up when we get into the more technical, how do you do it on the ground? Just a quick question to you. Um, is CABI doing any work at the moment within Southeast Asia or, or neighboring countries on any of these three uh, approaches, classical augmentation or conservation? Uh, yes, of course, we have a center in Malaysia and our China center also works uh, on this, um, in this approach, but not, of, not necessarily yet much on fall armyworm because it just arrived, yeah. but uh, on many other pests yet. And is there, I, I thought there was something potentially around fall armyworm from a classical, uh, some work there. Is that true? Or, or did I hear wrong? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand. Not understand Sorry, the was there some cabby work, I think, around uh, a classical introduction of a particular Yes, um, yes, predator? not yet, not yet in Southeast Asia. For, for the moment, we are working uh, for Africa and for, uh, and for, uh, and with Pakistan. Okay, Pakistan, yes, no, that's yes, what I Pakistan, heard. Yes, Pakistan, yes. And, and yes. how long does that take? So, so what, what stage is that up to? Well, it takes some time because classical biocontrol is the, it, it takes a long time to develop because you need all the, the risk assessments before, uh, 
before being allowed to release a, a natural enemy. Uh, and of, so there are lots of different steps. So you first need to assess which uh, which natural enemy is is among the most efficient in the in in the area of, of origin. Then you have to check whether these parasitoids or predators are safe for introduction. Yeah. Uh, it, this this needs a lot of work in quarantine, which is much more complicated than in. Uh, than, than outdoor, so it, it takes usually uh, several years. It can take five, ten years before the introduction of, years. of a natural enemy. Yeah. Okay, excellent. I've got That's a couple of Anna, questions here. Yes, so Anna, go, so Roger. This is Roger. Yeah. I was just going to chip in and say, um, I mean, several years' work has already been done, and uh, we have um, imported a natural enemy, a parasitoid of fall army worm, to our quarantine station in Pakistan. So yeah. the the, the you know the first candidate is in the in Asia but it, under quarantine and, and as Mark says it has to undergo a number of um, safety tests if you like host specificity testing before any release could be considered yeah no, no that's good thanks Roger you know that's ex exactly what I was referring to what I'd heard about um, so that, that's very interesting I've got a couple of questions here Mark and then we'll move on to the next um, part of your session um, is there any hyper parasitoids for those specific parasitoids mentioned is this from Cyril yes yes there are there are some uh, we haven't found many so far in the region of uh, of introduction, but uh, in uh, in the area of origin, there are there are hyperparasitoids which are known. Yes, I mean, uh, hyperparasitoids are not that prevalent in fall armyworm if you compare to, uh, for example, uh, aphids and so on, or other pests sometimes. Um, Oh, millibugs, for example, they can be very important. But yes, there are there are some parasitoids, especially of uh, of braconids. Excellent. Um, here's another question. At which time, like how after how many months or years after the detection of the fall armyworm in a new country or region, does you, do you make the choice between the three concepts of biocontrol? Yeah, I don't think there is a necessarily a choice to do. For example, with fall armyworm, we are doing the three in parallel. Uh, in at CAVI in, in, in our full army worm program, uh, uh, as we said earlier, we have a classical biocontrol project, but we are also developing methods for rearing and producing telenomus in, uh, in Africa and Asia. And uh, our, our colleagues in Africa are also developing methods to conserve um, natural enemies. They are not mutually exclusive and especially conservation and uh, needs to be done even when you do cl a classical biocontrol, you usually need to conserve the, the parasitoids or the predators which have been introduced as well as the native ones. So they are not mutually exclusive at all. Eh? So, uh, the, I mean, and, and the sooner the better. The sooner the better, excellent. Okay, um, thank you very much. What we might do, Mark, is I know you've got a lot of um, information to come and, I, and we're getting lots of questions in. What I might do is move forward and, and get into the sort of this big meaty second section of your presentation uh, and then we'll come back to questions. Okay. So I'll move, yeah. do you want, I'll move on to the next slide and you can yes. start. Okay, then here is about uh, assessing the natural enemy complex and their impact on fall armyworm, how to do it. Well, um, there are there are diff there are different levels of uh, difficulty. Uh, whether it is uh, stud about studying parasitoids and predators, these are very different techniques to be used, and also whether you want qualitative assessment or quantitative assessment. It's very easy to have a qualitative study of parasitoids, so just a list of parasitoids uh, attacking different uh, uh, development stage with an approximate um, and relative level of, uh, of, abund of abundance. It's a bit more complicated with predators because you don't necessarily uh, sample them in the same way. Uh, there are different predators which you sample in very different ways, but it's still possible to have a qualitative list of the predators present. Uh, it becomes more complicated when you want a true and uh, correct quantitative assessment of the, the natural enemies, which means what is the, the role of, of these parasitoids and predators in the mortality of the fall armyworm. It's difficult with parasitoids. It's more difficult than you would think 
to, to get a true parasitism rates. And it's extremely difficult uh, to get a, a true uh, assessment of uh, predator rates and the, the role of predators in controlling uh, the, the pest. There, there are not more than two or three studies on predators in the whole history of uh, studies of uh, natural enemies of fall armyworm that somehow try to, to assess uh, the role of predators. There are much more parasitism rates uh, occurring in the literature, uh, but most of them are not properly uh, uh, assessed. Next slide. So we we start first with with parasitism because I said uh, parasitism and predation are two very different uh, assessments. So it's not easy to to assess them uh, together, at least not with the same methods. Uh, I will start with qualitative assessment. How to get a list of um, of parasitoids uh, attacking fall armyworm in your region with uh, an approximative uh, idea of the respective roles? Well, this is very easy. Uh, uh, for the egg parasitoids, you search for egg masses on leaves, and so the egg masses are quite visible. Uh, you collect the entire egg mass. You, you may know it if they are apparently parasitized. The parasitized ones tend to be darker with, in color, but also the, the ones which are unparasitized but are ready to hatch are also dark. So it's, to, it's not that easy, but OK. Uh, so when you collect them, you need to place them in a cooler during transport, because in a car, you quickly get very high temperatures. And then uh, especially when you don't have a good air conditioning, then it it quickly dies. So you have to put them in a cool during transport. In the laboratory, you have to place the egg masses singly in a closed tube or closed petri dish, very close because uh, uh, these egg parasitoids are very small. You need to keep the humidity above 50% in your lab. So depending on the season, it may be more or less difficult because uh, these, these eggs, and also the same for the larvae, they dry out very quickly. You have to avoid direct light to avoid uh, a greenhouse effect in the, in the things. This is kind of a regular procedures for, the, for collecting insect, of course. This is nothing to do, especially with fall armyworm. You have to know the emergence of the, of the, of the larvae and the, parasit and the parasitoids and the number. And you have to place them in alcohol, or if you want to rear them, you can you can rear them. Next slide. For the larval parasitoids, well, it's a bit the same. Uh, you have to search for larvae on leaves. The first thing, of course, is to collect the right larvae. It's not it's more difficult than it seems, especially when it's a new species in a new environment. You have to use identification guides. Uh, if you are not familiar, depending on the region, it may be more or less easy, depending on uh, which native species also occur in, uh, on maize. So uh, th there is no special guide here. You, you really have to have a, a user guide for your region. Uh, so the larvae are cannibalistic. This is very important. You have to place them separately in tubes or in small uh, box or petri dishes with a piece of leaf especially leaves which have not been sprayed. Be careful with that. Or in small, oh, if, the, if the transport is short, you can also put them in small groups in bigger container with full of leaves where they don't, where they are much more likely to, to encounter leaves than, uh, than larvae because they are quite, they are quite uh, aggressive. And especially the problem is that the ones which are not parasitized are much more hungry than those which are parasitized. So if you leave them together, at the end, you, it's only the unparasitized ones will re, which will remain in the, in the container. You also have to place them in a cooler during transport, very important, otherwise you, you may get them all dead uh, when you arrive in the lab. Yes, next slide, please. You have to rear them all the larvae separately, uh, as I said, because of cannibalism either on diet, which you can change depending on the diet, depending on the condition every four to seven days. Sometimes some diets can last longer, it depends. Or on leaves, if you, if you use leaves, of course you have to leave, uh, you have to use untreated leaves, for example, maize leaves that have been grown 
on station that you know that they have not been sprayed, you have to change them every two days, otherwise uh, it, it dries too quickly, uh, especially if the relative humidity is, is, uh, is low. What is very important is that some parasitoids require substrate to make cocoons, especially uh, braconids and ichneumonids. They make uh, cocoons uh, in which they pupate. And uh, with several of these species, including the most abundant ones, uh, they need some kind of substrate to, uh, to make the cocoons. Otherwise, it does not work. Uh, they never make cocoons and the larvae die because if there is no cocoon, uh, the larvae can start making a pupa, but it, it will it will never uh, become an adult. So uh, you can, of course, what a, a possibility is to leave uh, when when uh, you are close to uh, to developing the the parasitoid, you may leave the old maize larvae uh, leaves in the in the petri dish and and put new ones in case they want to feed more. But if you use them, if you use diet, or even if you use uh, leaves, a good trick is to put cellulose paper, like toilet paper, for example, at the bottom of the boxes or in the tubes, so that uh, this will allow the, the parasitoid larva to make a cocoon. You can see there on the below, um, on the on the lower uh, photo, you can see cocoons of uh, Chelonus species. Uh, which without this paper would not be able to make their their cocoons. This is a, this is in group because it's a it's a it's a mass rearing. It's not a, it's not individual rearing for parasitism, but it's the same principle. When cocoons or pupae are obtained, uh, you have to wait for the emergence of the parasite. Oh, sorry, not yet. So when cocoons or pupae are obtained, wait for the emergence of parasitoids. Keep the cocoon with the parasitoid. It's very important when you when you want to make um, uh, when you want to identify them. It's always good to keep the cocoons with the parasitoid, especially when this is a rare parasitoid. It can be actually a hyperparasitoid, and and using this method, you know whether there's something totally different comes from a cocoon which is known from a, a primary parasitoid. Uh, you can put in alcohol or in the freezer for preparing insect. I will mention uh, this in more detail later on. Next slide. So of course, in most cases, uh, people are doing that. This is not, this is not uh, rocket science, which I mentioned. This is just regular uh, procedures for uh, uh, many other Lepidopteran parasitoids, the, the study of their of their of their parasitism. Um, um, but with these data, lots of people are also mentioning uh, percent parasitism, which is usually calculated, for example, by dividing the number of parasitized egg masses by the number of collected egg masses or the number of larval parasitoids obtained divided by the number of collected larvae, or a little bit better, divided by the number of larvae successfully reared to pupa or parasitoids. Uh, next slide. This is wrong. Uh, this is, uh, with this kind of method, you won't get a real um, assessment of parasitism. And the reason, uh, there are many reasons for that, um, which I, I can explain uh, in a few words uh, on the on the next slides. What are the issues? So first, starting with egg parasitoids. What are the issues with uh, egg parasitism? Well, first, the parasitized egg masses stay much longer in the field than unparasitized egg masses. Uh, it can be four times longer for Telenomus ramus. So it means that in a normal tropical weather, the uh, the fall armyworm egg masses will hatch after two or three days, and the uh, Telenomus and the Telenomus ramus, uh, the the ones which are parasitized by Telenomus ramus, the parasitoid will come out after ten days, twelve days. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, when you will uh, sample eggs x you will find much more frequently parasitized x than unparasitized x and also the 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 parasitized x stay a long time because they they are they are quite dark and they are quite visible so 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 if you just survey for 
for egg parasitism, uh, you will you will largely overestimate uh, egg parasitism if you don't take this into account. Next slide. And the solution, of course, is to study parasitism in a field where the same plant can be inspected every day. Like, for example, if you work on station, uh, you can go every day to inspect the same plants and you can tag the egg masses with the day of finding to be able to follow all the egg masses. And then you can follow uh, all the egg masses day by day, and then you can have a much better uh, idea of which percentage of the egg masses will be parasitized or not. Of course, in this case, you will also have a, you know some egg masses disappeared by predation and so on. It's not ideal, but at least it will, it, it will um, resolve at least a part of the bias. Uh, you can also use sentinel masses if, uh, the, if, the, um, if the egg masses are too complicated to find because for, for example, populations are too low. You can, you can put uh, egg masses which have been uh, laid in uh, the lab. Uh, on paper, on on the on maize. This is not a, the exact um, natural situation, though you may have a, a, a bias parasitism rate idea as well, because uh, because lots of parasitoids are especially attracted by the uh, by the the pheromones of by the the pheromones of the um, of the um, of the moss and the plant, and so they may not. It, it may not be a an exact ID, but it's, it, it can greatly facilitate uh, the assessment of egg parasitism. And uh, this needs to be very fresh because lots of these parasitoids, they lay eggs only in the, in, the fresh, uh, in the fresh egg masses. Also, don't forget that not all eggs of egg masses are parasitized. You, you have to measure this, this parameter also in the lab. Um, that was for egg parasitism. Now for larval parasitism, uh, what are the issues? Um, well, an important issue is that <clears throat> early larval parasitoids will kill their host before larval maturity. For example, if there are 16 star, they will kill their host in the, in the 14 star, sometimes in the 15 star, but not in the 16 star in most cases for most larval parasitoids. Uh, and late larval parasit. Sorry, it's not yet uh, the solution. And most larval parasitoids uh, will attack um, uh, large larvae. Like for example, the tachinids, several tachinid species will only attack the mature larvae. Thus, if you collect larvae of all ages, you will underestimate larval parasitism. I just can give an example. Oh, sorry, just, just, yeah, next slide, please. And the solution is to collect different larval stages, not only the big one, that would be a, a mistake, but, but all the larval stages, uh, especially from the third instar on. Uh, note the larval stages at collection and at death from parasitism. That's very important as well. You need to know which instars you collect and which instar are killed by by this or that parasitoid, you have to use the head capsule width, not the body size, uh, to know the, the host instar. Uh, this is a very well-known thing, but, but, but think of that because lots of people still use the, the body size to assess uh, the, um, the host uh, stage, but this is not really correct. Uh, there, are, there are publications with the head capsule width, uh, several uh, publications on that. Uh, you and then you have to add and integrate parasitism at the different larval stage to calculate parasitism. If uh, enough data are available from different instars, a partial life table calculation can be used. I can just uh, mention in the next uh, show in the next slide, please. A very simple example. Usually the the cases are much more complicated than than that. But let's take a very simple example to show what a, a, a a partial life table approach uh, means. Like for example, uh, someone's collect 200 larvae. Half of them are small, medium, and half of them are mature larvae, last in star. In both categories, you have 20% parasitism. 
one by a braconit and uh, and uh, and big larvae by tachinit. So most people or or the natural reflex we said will be to say well parasitism on average is 20%. But this is of course totally untrue. If you if you are looking for example uh, so a life table approach would show that if you start with 100 larvae this is theoretical if 20% die in uh, in the first four or five uh, in the first four or five instars by one parasitoid you have 20 dead 80% survive among these 80% with survive uh, uh, 20% are parasitized by the tachinids, which means 16 dead, which means that 36% of the 100 larvae will die from parasitism. So parasitism in this case is 36%. It's not 20%. And I think that's very important. And these are very important errors that are, are done in many in many um, studies on on parasitism. They they. They underestimate parasitism as much as they overestimate egg parasitism. So next slide. Then another issue which I found out when I started uh, working uh, on that in uh, Latin America to survey for uh, for parasitoids there, is that when um, it is the fact that parasitized larvae are much less visible. They do much, much less damage. And this, they are often much less collected than unparasitized one. If you look, see at the, at the graph, this is a graph that was done by my colleague, uh, Koku Agboi in, in, in Ghana by uh, when studying one of these uh, small, small instar larvae parasitoid, Coxygidium luteum. You can see that uh, the unparasitized larvae eat far, far, more than the parasitized larvae. And you can see here, uh, so on the bottom uh, image, the two larvae unparasitized and parasitized at the same at the same instar just before the, or at least at the same age, uh, just before the, um, the parasitoid will kill the parasitized one. So what does it mean? It means that the damage and the size of the unparasitized uh, larvae in the field is far more vis is far more visible than the parasitized one, and so especially when people go to farmers' field, they they want to collect a larvae, but they will go immediately uh, to the the plants which are heavily attacked by fall armyworm to make their samples especially when the farmer sits beside, you don't want to dig out an apparently healthy plant, but it's usually in the apparently healthy plants that you will find the, the parasitized one. So uh, next slide, please. So to overcome that, you need to search for larvae in plants with low damage as well, not preferably, but just as well. And, and this, is, this means that you have to do destructive sampling. For example, uh, you can do that on station rather than uh, at the farmers who doesn't like you to destroy his healthy plants. And this is very important. You have to select your plants before and then check every single small parasitized larvae, which, not, which is not visible from outside. Otherwise, you will, you will again, this is another reason to underestimate larval parasitism. And this is also partly why in the literature in, in the Americas, you have usually very, very low rates of parasitism in the literature, which, especially larval parasitism, which which is which is caused by these two main main issues. Next slide. Then a few additional advisors to assess parasitism. Um, of course, you have to know the factors that may affect parasitism. Plant growth stage. There are various scales uh, available in the literature about uh, maize or other plants growing stage. The level of fall armyworm attack, there are also various scales available or you can make your own scale. Uh, management methods, whether it is uh, sprayed or not, uh, uh, whether there is intercropping or not and, and so on and so on. Uh, 
So also for the reason I mentioned, but I, re I, I, I repeat it, you have to do randomly selected plans for quantitative assessment. And the field sampling protocol can be followed, for example, using a zigzag or W uh, scheme, like, you know, just, uh, but of course you can do your own field sampling protocol. You don't necessarily have to follow uh, uh, protocols which are used by others, depending on what you have available. Note all the regular survey data, like the coordinates, the dates, the collector, and things like this. And as I said earlier, develop your own sampling protocol, depending on the local situation, infestation, funding, objectives. The objective is important because it may decide whether it is better to make frequent samples at the same sites or to replicate sites with one or two sampling only. It depends on the objectives. That's why I don't like to give uh, um, uh, very precise protocols because the, the objectives can be very different depending on, on which factor you want to study. Next slide. Okay, that was for parasitism. Um, then uh, predation is the same. Huh? Uh, qualitative assessment is easier than quantitative. But in this case, there are many different types of predations and predators. There are, so of course, there are many different collection methods. Uh, if you want to study parasitoids, you have to collect the host. But uh, if, you, if you want to study predation, you can't really uh, collect uh, the prey because, they, uh, because the predators are not necessarily present when you do that. You can, of course, observe direct field observation a field observation of predation, like a predator uh, ac actively feeding. That's of course, that's very uh, useful, but it's unless you stay long in the field, it's not, you don't often get that. Uh, you can use visual counts of supposedly predators on randomly selected plants. So you, you, you select uh, as for parasitoids, a certain number of plants using a, a certain protocol. Uh, and then you check the plants very well, and then you check whether there are ants, whether there are earwigs, uh, and, and so on, on the plant, or bugs, and so on. And then you collect the predators, and of course, what is very important, if you haven't seen the, 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 the predation event on the field, you have to test the predator in the lab by offering eggs and larvae to make sure that these are real predators of the fall armyworm, especially in a, in a newly invaded regions where, where the predators have never encountered the, the armyworm. Next slide. And quantitative assessment, this is really a, a problem. Uh, assessing predation rate, which is the mortality due to predation is very complicated. Cal calculation implies a life table approach. Uh, as I showed uh, simply for parasitoids, which means assessing mortality rate at different stages of development, but it's, much, it's more complicated for predators than for, um, for parasitoids, because when you do that, you just know that uh, uh, the, the the, the prey has disappeared, but you don't know by what, for example. So it requires a good idea of the main predators first in qualitative assessment in advance to develop quantitative assessment methods. It's even more important than for, for parasitoids. It, it can only be done at a later stage after you know very well the biology uh, and, the, and, and the efficacy of the, of the most important predators. Potential techniques uh, include uh, sentinel X for, for so or larvae and pupae. Uh, um, so by exposing material from the from lab rearing, the sentinel X and pupae are quite easy to expose. The larvae, uh, that's why I put them in parentheses. It's much more complicated because the larvae are moving a lot, and uh, they often disappear, so it's much more complicated. You can also use uh, exclusion cages, which means that uh, putting cages uh, uh, around uh, uh, some plants and not around others to see the difference between uh, the protected plants and the ones which are not protected, uh, or you can protect them also by banding uh, the, 
the, the stems and things like that. So there are different methods. The, the fact is that by like, for example, by using exclusion cages, you don't necessarily know which predator uh, will be prevented uh, will be prevented from attack. And you can also use, of course, with more sophisticated things, cameras, for example. That's uh, it's also complicated because lots of these things happen at, at night. Um, so the fall army worm is partially nocturnal, and uh, so they are often uh, during the, you know, when the sun is shining, they are, they are hidden in the in the plant. So it's uh, not so easy to to study that. Next slide, please. An intermediate solution, uh, it's quantitative data on predators abundance. And this is what usually people have done, uh, few people, but some people have done when they are studying predation to have at least quantitative data, which means that when the main predators are known, for example, you know, it's mainly a, a, an earwig or a bug, their abundance can be measured to assess the influence of various factors. For example, for conservation by control, uh, like, for example, you can measure their abundance in intercropping versus monoculture. You can um, measure them their abundance in a, in a, in a pesticide treated uh, a plot versus uh, untreated plot and so on. And then even without knowing the exact predation rate, at least you know which, um, uh, which uh, cultural practices will favor a predator's of which you know that is an important predator of the, um, the fall army worm, even if you can't quantify it uh, perfectly. Different trapping and counting systems can be used depending on the predators. Uh, you can use bait traps, for example, for, uh, for ants, or you can use pitfall traps for carabs and others, sticky traps for flying insects, visual counts, uh, sweep nets, etc., etc. But this really depends on the main predators which you want to study. Next slide, please. OK. I think I finished the second part. Alison, if you have questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Mark. That was incredibly interesting. Um, I was really struck also just by those tips as well around making sure you don't underestimate the um, parasitism. I thought, I thought that was, that's very useful. And I, I, know, I know that talking to some people on the chat here, there's a lot of people doing work in this area. And I know those that sort of advice is going to be very helpful. Um, I have quite a few questions here that would be good to, uh, to ask you. Um, noting that we've just got to go a little bit faster in the next section. So here's a question here, Mark. Is it possible to get natural enemies if we keep one or two rows of crops in the farm unsprayed while the rest are continued to be sprayed? Well, it depends on the natural enemies. It depends, uh, um, of course, it can be helpful. Uh, but it needs to be studied case by case. I, I, I'm not aware of these techniques on fall armyworm with the fall armyworm natural enemies. It may be helpful with some, uh, I guess with uh, um, species which are moving a bit less or more. Uh, it, so it may influence the success of this technique, but I, I'm not aware that someone has tried this technique for fall armyworm and its natural enemies. Okay, here's another question from David. What type of diet do you feed the fall armyworm larvae in the lab? Well, in Switzerland, because the, the, the manpower is so expensive, we buy the diet, already made diets. It's a, I mean, there are lots of things like, uh, you know, like a weed germ, like kazi. I mean, there, the, I mean, there are recipes everywhere in the, in the literature. I don't exactly remember what, what so what all the components are, uh, of course, uh, in uh, in um, in countries where manpower is uh, is not as expensive, it's 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 much better to do it by yourself. Um, uh, but I mean, the recipes are in the literature. There are various recipes that are usually based on uh, on uh, wheat bran or wheat germ and, uh, and these kind of uh, things with uh, with with proteins, with vitamins, with antifungic uh, components, uh, and so on and so on. OK, here's, here's a question here. Is, is it possible to find references of identifying instars by using their head capsules? 
Yes, yes, sure. I can I can send these. Uh, this is uh, this is very uh, this is available in many literature. I think there is even a, a publication that has um, reviewed all the different uh, measurements because the the measurements can vary from one uh, study to the other because depending on the the food you give them. Uh, you may get, especially in a lab rearing, you may get very different uh, results. You may even get much more in stars than six in star if the food is not ideal. Uh, but so that's why it's always better at the beginning when you have your own uh, system to uh, to try yourself first uh, in uh, the region in the in your in your system uh, to to try to measure this first. But uh, the uh, most of the field data are quite similar okay. so yes they are available i can provide this literature excellent thanks mark here, here's a question here if our candidate biocontrol agent is nocturnal uh, what other parameters can we look at in the field other than field abundance to relate it to the full armyworm population to say that it is a potential agent of course, aside from the assay, assay tests we usually do in the lab. Yeah, well, I mean, usually the nocturnal natural enemies are rather the, the so, so the predators, some predators are more active nocturnally. And of course, in this case, you have to use uh, uh, different traps depending on the, on the predators. Um, you have to use, um, you know, for example, pitfall traps, sticky traps, and so on, which will also catch the nocturnal predators. Excellent. Okay. So, well, yeah, this a is a good. This is a good thing that I I didn't think of it, but uh, I'm I'm wondering about nocturnal parasitoids. Whether they <laughs> they also occur nocturnally? This is just uh, reminds me that a question that I haven't thought about. Well, that's. That's that's good then, Mark. I, I, <laughs> I think that's a good outcome to give you more to think about because uh, we need all all your mind power uh, on this on this topic at the moment. Um, here's a question here, and I guess it gets back to this pesticides in the field. Um, where if we release trichogamma in the field, uh, how can we know how much its release works? Because we cannot manage farmers not to use pesticides in the field. Well, I think, um, you know, using pesticides with augmentative uh, biocontrol is very complicated. Yeah. Um, it's at least at first, at first, all the trials have to be made without pesticides. And, uh, and then case by case, you can see whether you, uh, you can, you can integrate, but usually pesticide in integrated pest management have to be used uh, very cautiously and only when uh, it's, it's deemedly necessary. And okay. in most cases, when you are using augmentative biocontrol, it is to avoid the use of, of pesticides. Okay. Great answer. Okay, we're going to move on, Mark, because we don't have too much more time. Uh, we're at, at 5.09 in my time, and we're going to finish at half past today. Um, yeah, the last so, part is, is quite short. Now. Yeah, I mean, so the, it, but this was we, not well equilibrated between the two. No, no, that's fine, because we can go through that, and then we'll leave the, the last bit for questions. Um, so if everyone, if you have questions, here's your chance to really put them in the Q&A box um, and get them answered at the end of the session. So, so please do, because you've got a real expert here. And also, also, your questions will sort of be collated uh, along with the chat and we'll follow up uh, through this whole six month series. So it's a really good chance for you to sort of get involved and get interactive. So please use the Q&A box and Mark, I'll just move to the, the next slide for you now. Yes. Okay. So identification of natural enemies. Once you have collected them, you need to know what they are. First, a few general remarks. All adult natural enemies obtained for rearing or survey material should be kept because uh, there is sometimes the tendency to keep just a few specimens and to throw away the rest uh, because you think it's the same. But you have, of course, the possibility of closely related species. And then when you realize that, that there are two closely related species, it's too late because you have thrown away uh, most of the, of the specimens. So it's, it's important to keep every, every specimens. 
Uh, not all, you have to expect that not all the natural enemies will have a name, especially in a newly introduced uh, region. You may have, you may collect a lot of parasitoids or predators that are simply not described or will have uh, be given a name, but which will finally uh, uh, become a, an unknown species. That's quite common as well. Sometimes people tend to give a name, but uh, at the end uh, we realize that uh, this is a species that has never been described. So you don't expect all natural enemies to give a name. You have to work with specialists uh, uh, at national or international level. It's always important. Don't try necessarily, well, of course you can try. You can uh, try to, to try yourself first to separate uh, the different morpho species. So so specimens that look like the same species, uh, but you need interaction with the specialist to improve your knowledge at the beginning. Uh, it can be a taxonomist uh, or molecular biologist or both, if preferably. But it has to improve. It has to. You have to work with that. Don't try to publish, for example, without at least showing your specimen to to a specialist, unless you are a specialist yourself. Yes, next slide, please. So you have two different uh, main, main methods to identify natural enemies. Uh, uh, through the traditional morphological identification by taxonomists, specialists in their field, based on uh, identification keys and uh, collection specimens in museums and so on or barcoding by molecular biologists. Uh, usually the, the one, so for insects, it's the CO1 gene which is used, which is called the barcode. Uh, there are more and more insect species which are barcoded in, um, in, the, uh, in the literature or in the, in the banks, in the, in the barcoding banks. But uh, you have to expect that many parasitoids are not uh, it's 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 even much better than three or four years ago, uh, but uh, it so it improves a lot. But you still have this 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 problem, and you don't have to expect that all the specimens which have a barcode in the in the in the barcoding systems are correctly identified. That's another issue, of course. Next slide. But what is very very important to keep in mind is that these two techniques are complementary. They work best when used together. Don't rely necessarily only on barcoding to uh, to have your insects identified. It's always good to have uh, the morphological backup and to 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 make sure that uh, that uh, this these identifications make sense and so on. Because sometimes the barcoding end up with a no sense no sense result. So it's important to work with, uh, with taxonomists which, which know about the morphology uh, of, of the species. Huh? That's, that's, very, that's very, very important. I, I would insist on that. Next slide. So about preparation and conservation uh, for the morphology, specimens are killed alive, should be killed alive. Uh, because they are easier to prepare. If you take dry insects at the bottom of your cage or your container and then uh, uh, try to prepare them, or, I mean, they will immediately break. Of course, there are techniques to make them uh, softer and so on and things like this. But it's, it's always better when you keep them as soon as possible alive or when they are very freshly dead. Freezer is, I found freeze, you know, putting them in the freezer the easiest. It's not necessarily the, the, the methods um, where they, they are the best um, presented, but still it's, it's by far the easiest and the least toxic. There are some, some other toxic uh, components that are used in so to, to keep them uh, uh, well softened, but that's not, uh, I mean, honestly, I, I really, I really prefer the freezer myself. Or you can also put them in alcohol at seventy percent if the main, if you think that they need uh, morphological uh, preparation for morphological identification. If you put uh, alcohol with higher uh, percentage, they become extremely breakable. 
so it's not good. On the other hand, for the barcoding, um, the best is to put them in alcohol at the highest percentage possible. I mean, the people who are, you know, molecular biologists will tell you to take the, the highest alcohol percentage as possible and put them in the freezer. In reality, uh, they can still, uh, uh, usually in most cases, one can, it can be, be also analyzed uh, specimens in alcohol uh, without freezer or in alcohol at 70% with freezer and things like this. There are now, of course, lots of techniques that can also extract uh, DNA with a dead specimen, dry specimen. But uh, this is much more complicated. So don't make uh, the, the life of the molecular biologist difficult. And uh, it, so if you, if you send them uh, the, uh, the insect killed by putting them in a high percentage alcohol, uh, that's, that's the best. Next slide. Uh, where and how to send it um, to national or international taxonomist and molecular biologist. If you have national taxonomists who you trust, that's usually better because you have national collections and so on and things. Uh, if you want to use international expertise, you, you have to follow uh, the access and benefit sharing regulation of your country. Every country has different regulations. There are countries from where it's very easy to send uh, a specimen to another country. There are some countries from where it's extremely difficult because of very strict regulations. So you have to be aware of that. But most most people, most entomologists will uh, will know that, especially those who work on international issues and so on. I can advise, but uh, I can I can uh, I can even receive uh, samples, and uh, I don't do molecular. Uh, uh, analyze myself, but I can find ways to do it uh, with my cabbie colleagues, but only if it's parasitoids and only if it's from fall armyworm. Uh, please <laughs> don't send me any kind of uh, natural enemy, uh, also from other pests, because I will not be able to handle that. But of course, with now our expertise on fall armyworm parasitoid, we get more and more samples from everywhere. We have the corresponding barcodes and so on. So it's uh, it becomes quite easy for us to uh, to um, to identify or to advise where to send them. Sorting to morphospecies uh, by the scientists themselves or the taxonomy group is important because uh, first because no specialist covers all group. You can't find any specialist which can identify to species level tachinids and uh, braconids, for example. Uh, even sometimes there are specialists, world specialists, that only on, on one or two subfamilies of braconids. Then, of course, you have more generalist ones, but even there, they, they, are prob they are not able to, to identify to the species level all specimens. So it's good to sort to more for species, but also for you. Also for the scientists, it's good to um, send to more for species because then you can at first send only a part of the specimens or the, of the abundant species. The rare species, you may want to send it, but if you have a lot of the same specimens having the same cocoon, exactly the same uh, look, then you can first start by, by sending the most different of all these specimens. If possible, keep voucher specimens and make a reference collection, that's very important. Provide as many details on the sample, whether it is for a, mole a molecular or morphological identification, the host, the host plan, the date location, date location, collector. If from cocoon, it's good to provide uh, the cocoon as well, especially for morphological identification. Uh, if barcoding, uh, you have, it's usually now the, you know, the airplane companies, uh, um, the flight companies ask to remove the alcohol before shipment and ship by, and then of course, then you have to ship by express courier so that people who receive them can fill them in when, uh, when it arrives. It, if it's within a week, there is no problem. You can, uh, you can easily do that. Uh, you can also ask the molecular entomologist uh, the molecular biologist, sorry, to to use non-destructive methods. In the past, uh, the the insects were were squashed, and uh, you cannot, you could not uh, identify them later. But uh, or you, for big insects, of course, you can uh, you can use a leg or, or 
even an antenna or things like this, but now there are non-destructive methods that can be used so that the, the insects is dipped into the, you know, the, the, the products and, and then you still get your, your specimen for control after all, after that. And then the last, um, a last uh, note for quantitative studies of parasitoid, it is important to identify the parasitoid larvae that fail to develop to the adult stage. Sometimes, um, sometimes it is um, very abundant. It is very frequent in some studies that a lot of these larvae can't make, can't go to the adult stage. If identification is not possible through morphological characters uh, from the larvae, uh, you have to keep dying of freshly dead larvae or pupae in alcohol for barcoding. That's also possible, of course. Next slide, I think it's, ah oh, yes, and last advice. I would strongly advise you to collaborate. Don't be afraid to share experience and results. Uh, li uh, science is much more fun when you share your, your results, when you work together, when you publish together, when you discuss, when you exchange samples and so on. Uh, this can be done through various ways. At CABI, we have a CABI a full armyworm research collaboration portals for those who are not yet there, they can, they can uh, go and uh, they can uh, inscribe themselves and uh, chat with uh, or, or ask questions or or um, or describe their their studies or upload the, the the natural enemies found in the country and so on. We also have a newly made IOBC International Organization of Biocontrol subgroup on fall army worm biocontrol. Uh, we are going to organize um, meetings, especially uh, after the COVID uh, crisis. But even now, we are going to try to organize. Uh, an online discussion. Of course, this is more for uh, uh, scientists uh, really working on uh, on biocontrol. Uh, and there are plenty of other opportunities to share and collaborate. So, uh, so have fun when uh, and we keep contact. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and I definitely think having fun is always a good uh, <laughs> recommendation, um, particularly uh, combined with any science endeavour. So I've got a couple of questions for you. We haven't got too long for this, but um, I do want to get through as many as possible. So here is one. Do you use ethyl acetate for killing your predators? Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, the, the insects are very well spread when you I, I don't like to use this chemical myself for my own health. Um, I'm not too sure what it, it is the exact um, status in terms of toxicity of ethyl acetate these days. These things change depending on what the, but I stopped, I've stopped using ethyl acetate 20 years ago uh, when I, when I got a freezer in my lab, it's, it's just easier. But I agree that the, the insects are, are kept more spread and, and, and are easier to prepare when they are killed by ethyl acetate. Okay, thanks. Here's another question. Which are primer pairs specific for identification of the Chelonus species and the Telenomus species in the molecular method? Well, I mean, the, these are very easily uh, identified through the simple CO1 uh, barcode. So uh, we don't need any others to, to get uh, the identification with that. Okay. Another question. Are there any possible pheromone or volatile compounds to enhance the attraction of parasitoid to fall armyworm? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm, um, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't think that but maybe I'm wrong. I've never looked into that, but uh, it could only be uh, with egg parasitoids then, of course, because okay. uh, the, the, of course the pheromones are emitted uh, by, by the females, but uh, not necessarily when they lay the eggs. So um, I don't know. I don't think that it, 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 is a, it is a good way to enhance. I mean, it depends. There are some insects uh, which don't move very much. Like, I mean, uh, thing which come directly into my mind are uh, mealybugs, for example, scale insects, 
where females uh, emit pheromones to attract uh, winged males. They are themselves not winged, but the males are winged. So they come, they mate, and then the females lay their eggs. Um, so they can, um, then parasitoids can use uh, this to locate females and their progenies. Uh, with the full army worm, it's possible that uh, that the egg parasitoids are attracted. I'm sure they are attracted by compounds that are used, that are included in the egg masses. These are not directly the sex pheromones, I guess, but uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Okay. Well, the person who asked that question might have some more information. Maybe they're, maybe they're looking yeah. at that. So um, please uh, contact us. But we'll be sending out an email to everyone anyway, so that'll be a good chance to sort of respond to us as well. And we'll pass any questions or any of the research you're doing on. Um, I've got another question here. In your studies, Mark, uh, did you see more or less parasitism in relation with the size of the field? I'm thinking of commercial fields for seed production as in some places in Kenya? Well, yeah, for the moment, uh, we are still studying that. Uh, I mean, this, these studies take time and the invasion of fall armyworm is, uh, is, um, is recent. So um, I don't I don't know. I don't know for the moment whether there are. I mean, I know that some of our colleagues are presently studying the effect of uh, monoculture and versus uh, versus intercropping. But usually they are using uh, small plot, uh, small plots, not very large plots. So uh, I don't think this is known. Maybe some people in uh, in Kenya, like Isipe, have already studied that. But uh, I don't remember seeing that in the literature. Right, thanks, Mark, and thanks for the question, Pierre. Um, and last question here: As Telenomus and Trichogramma can attack full armyworm, is there a possibility that this multi-parasitism leads to the death of one of the parasitoids? Uh, yes, for sure. Uh, I mean, in an usually in a, in in an egg, you cannot have a. I don't think you can have a Telenomus and a Trichogramma coming together. But uh, on the other hand. Uh, uh, Trigogramma and Telenomus have been uh, tested together by different scientists in Latin America, but also I think in Africa, and uh, the results are quite positive. So you can combine the two, but of course uh, per egg uh, you will not have a, a Telenomus coming out with a Trigogramma. Great. Well, that we're going to end it there. And I'd just like to thank you very much, Mark. I mean, that was a, a great session, really good practical tips. Uh, and it's wonderful to have you share that with us. Um, so thank you very much from all of us. Um, and we'll, we'll be in touch anyway. Mark will be continuing to work on this with us. And so any of your questions that come through from the email that I send out, or if you just want to email me or Mark, uh, you're most welcome to, and, and we can follow up. So remember, it's a six month sort of series. So we really want to keep that conversation going uh, and connect all the different uh, laboratories and all the different sort of field efforts that you're doing out there as well. And I noticed a lot on the chat. So it's, it's very good to see. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the invitation. You're most welcome. And I'm just going to introduce Roger. Roger always gets the sort of uh, very sort of squeezed section at the end for the summary. I, I normally tell him sort of five minutes, but then make it 30 seconds. Uh, but he is wonderful at doing, <laughs> doing that on the spot, Roger. Welcome back. Thanks, <laughs> Alison, and thanks a lot to Mark for that uh, highly informative uh, presentation. Um, just to emphasize Mark's point about collaboration, um, Alison will be, I know, setting up ways for collaboration within ASEAN, but also um, this is a global community of researchers that we can all be part of, so feel free to collaborate in the ways Mark has suggested. And the other thing is that it's very interesting, this research, and we can get really buried in the details, and that's we need to, but let's also keep in mind the farmers who are eventually trying to provide solutions for. It's no good doing lots of very good research if we don't, in the end, help the farmers solve this huge problem. So, so keep that in your mind, even as you look down your microscopes at the small parasitoids we're talking about. Thank you, Alison. 
Thank you very much. I'll just put my video on at the end too, just to say uh, hello and farewell to everyone. Um, so thank you so much. And it's a very good point to end on to remember um, what we really have to achieve on the ground is control of full army worm. Uh, and that we have to partner that partner with farmers um, to achieve that. Um, just a quick uh, shout out again. I know I've mentioned it. Please join us for the rest of the series. Uh, it's open participation. Tell your um, colleagues who may be interested uh, or your students um, to, to take part in one of these uh, eight sessions. Uh, and of course, we'll have a big sort of workshop this is the aim at the end uh, in June. And hopefully, you know, some of that could be uh, in person, but we never know. It could be on online as well with COVID. But thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you at the next session in uh, early January. Uh, and uh, stay safe. And uh, we look forward to uh, your participation and your uh, interaction going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Graham and Prana. Bye. Bye, everyone.